Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank everyone to attend for attending this uh, very last um, referee talk. I am tired, so I can I can I can understand that almost everybody will be tired. So thank you, everyone. But um, let me assure you, we have a very interesting topic today. Um, it's it's about one of the issues that we found on our VMs uh, regarding latency and how we went about fixing those issues. So uh, me, Vineet, and my colleague, Joel, um, we work on Chrome OS uh, team on the kernel performance, virtualization, et cetera. So um, yeah, so we'll, the agenda for the day would be, um, I'll explain the problem, then the root cause of why it happens and the solution that we came up with and some performance numbers and some future work that we are planning to do. So the problem, um, on a loaded system, we were experiencing latencies on the VMs. That, that, that's the basic problem. And by a loaded system, the host has a lot of things to run, especially on Chrome OS. Uh, it's a busy system on a low-end device. So um, as you know, Chrome OS runs Android apps, and these apps run on a VM. Um, so latency-sensitive uh, things like audios and video playback was experiencing glitches and unsmooth playback. So obviously the reason should be um, vCPU is a task on a host and it's not getting time to run. That's why you are seeing latencies on the, on the guest. But when you dig deeper into it, the main issue is uh, something we termed as double scheduling. So you have two operating systems running. You have a host operating system, uh, which has a lot of tasks task to run, of which a couple of them would be vCPUs. And then you have a virtual machine inside that you have uh, its own task to run. And the host doesn't know what a VCP is running, but it, it schedules based on its priority and V runtime. And the VM doesn't know what the host is running. So it, it, it might make uh, ineffective decisions when it selects a VCPU and select bots to run. So this blind double scheduling ultimately boils down to issues like latencies, power consumption, resource utilization, et cetera. So, um, I have an example here when a, when an issue happened. I'm really sorry, we don't have a good picture, but I'll try to explain the rows. Um, so the second and third row is uh, the vCPU thread uh, and followed by two rows, which is the physical CPUs and followed by two rows, which is the uh, virtual CPUs. And on the second and third row, the dark green color is when the v, uh, vCPU gets to run and the light green color when it's runnable, but preempted. So as you can see, when, when we were experiencing a video lag, um, a considerable amount of time was spent on the run queue, but not able to run. Yeah. So yeah, these two are what we have. Are you able to see my mouse? Okay, cool. Yeah, so these two, as you can see, the light green color is runnable, but preempted. And the dark green color is uh, when it's running. So a considerable amount of time it's spending in the run queue without able to run. So, um, okay, now let's think about, we know the uh, problem. So let's think, think about some solutions, okay? Um, so priority is the issue. It's not getting time to run. So let's let's boost it to RT. So we have uh, VCPUs boosted to RT. VCPUs are happy. Uh, it gets to run when it wants to run, but the, now the problem is reversed. So you have latency sensitive applications in the host, which wants to run, and you don't have, you have normal task on the VCPU, but it's boosted to RT, so it preempts the host and then you face latencies on the host. Not ideal. Okay, let's take a step back. The issue is priority, but ultimately the issue is um, double scheduling. So blind double scheduling. So let host and guest talk. Like, let, let them share information. Let them share the scheduling parameters. Let them schedule, uh, share the scheduling state. So now the host knows what the vCPU might be running and the vCPU knows what the host is running. Now they, you can make some um, educated decisions about what to run, where to run. And we can possibly uh, fix this issue. So now let's come to our problem where priority is the issue that it's not able to run. So um, this is a very specific use case of the cooperative uh, guest and host scheduling. Um, so what, in this specific case, in this specific issue that we face, we only need to uh, communicate the priority requirements of the guest to the host. 
So the guest basically, basically says, okay, I need to run something important. Please let me run. And the host can take actions based on that. By the way, if you have any questions, just, just, just break us in between. Um, so we'll be happy to answer. So uh, this is basically the, the this uh, this complete feature is about the project is about. Uh, so if the host really knows that the vCPU is going to run something important and latency sensitive, the host can proactively boost it. Uh, for example, interrupt injection. And if the host doesn't know, and then if the guest wants to run something priority uh, latency critical, then the guest can basically request it using a hyper call. And once it once it um, so, sorry, the guest can uh, let, let its uh, intent know to the host and then the host can take action. And now we come to safety mechanisms where there can be rogue or buggy kernel and the host should implement throttling and forceful unboosting if it sees that there is, a, there is something uh, bad actor on, on the guest. Okay, now let's come to what are the latency critical or sensitive context. So these are the things that we identified NMIs, interrupts, and software air queues um, need to be serviced uh, uh, fast. Then task with priority higher than SCED others. So SCED RT or above uh, should be given importance. And whenever you disable preemption in the guest, that also needs to be taken care of uh, immediately. I wanted to discuss one issue related to priority inversion because with this dynamic boosting, some vCPUs might, might be running boosted and some might be running unboosted. And if it occurs such that a unboosted vCPU is taking a spin lock and it gets preempted and you have a boosted vCPU which blocks on that spin lock, then you have an issue. So there is a bounded priority inversion issue which happens. But luckily, as I showed before, preemption disabled, we, also, we consider preemption disabled as a latency sensitive uh, context and spin locks disabled preemption. So this is also automatically taken care of. Okay, now I hand it over to Joel uh, to explain the implementation. Thanks, Vineet. Um, so uh, just for anybody who came late, like, so basically the idea that we're, the problem with, that we're trying to solve is that if you have something latency sensitive inside a guest, there's, uh, 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 you know, we're not aware, if we're not aware of that in the host, then we, we might not, uh, we might uh, not be able to do scheduling properly. So, uh, uh, continuing what Vineet uh, was saying, like so, I'll go into a little bit of the implementation. Our proof of concept uh, currently is only for x86, but it's portable to other architectures. We're about to post an RFC to the mailing list. We've been working on this stuff for uh, eight months or so now. Um, so the, the you know Vineet mentioned the sharing of information between the guest and the host. So right now, what we have is a per CPU. Uh, structure that the guest has allocated and it shares the uh, address of that uh, structure with the host uh, using an MSR. So it writes into an, the pointer into that MSR and now the host uh, knows where that structure is. And uh, you know, the, the cur currently the boosting that we do is to RT, uh, scared round robin and uh, at priority eight, but this is uh, tunable. And the unboosting we do is to uh, scare other, uh, and uh, you know, in the in the POC, our unboosting is uh, is only to scare other, but we are planning to make that uh, tunable as well. So you can boost and unboost to whatever you think makes sense for your system. We go to the next slide. Um, so we also made it such that this fe these features can be enabled uh, uh, per VM. So let me go over first how the how a guest is made aware of the availability of this feature. So the host uses uh, a CPU ID to advertise the feature to the guest. Um, so the VMM basically uh, queries uh, KVM for what are all the features that are available, and uh, you know, and then. Uh, Enables uh, enables the feature in our POC. We always uh, advertise it, um, uh, but uh, in the final upstream implementation, uh, we would not want to force uh, force this feature that way. 
and then we have uh, uh, knobs to enable and disable uh, the feature globally as well on, on the whole system. Okay, so for this, so there's synchronous boost, unboost, and asynchronous boost, unboost. So the synchronous part, we have hypercall mechanisms. So synchronously, the, the, the VM would issue a hypercall saying that it needs to uh, do the boost or unboost right now. For the boost, actually, we only implemented the uh, synchronous part, but we are not planning to use it because we actually boost asynchronously because we can avoid a hypercall uh, a lot of the times. Um, and for the unboost, it has to be um, synchronous because we, we, we want to make sure that as soon as we're done running the important stuff, we don't want to continue running the unimportant stuff as, our, as RT or high priority. So that has to be synchronous. Uh, questions? Um, and just to go over the unboosting part, we, we we un we, when we unboost, we have to make sure that the context that we're about to run is not important. So if we switch to scale other in the scheduler from RT, then from the scheduler, we uh, issue a hypercall saying, you know, we're about to switch into normal tasks, like please unboost us. Um, and then we have other uh, uh, parts of the guest kernel, which we also, like for example, the interrupt exit path, we uh, unboost there as well. If we are exiting into a context, like for example, if there's no software queues pending and uh, the interrupt happened in a preempt enabled section, uh, and uh, there's no RT tasks uh, that were interrupted, then we know that on the interrupt exit, we're about to, uh, we're about to uh, run uh, unimportant stuff, normal tasks. Uh, so, we, so we request an unboost there as well. Um, we don't do boosting and unboosting on local IRQ disable and enable. Uh, that's still TBD. Uh, we don't know if that's required or not, so that we're still working on that part. So one of the things I was, we were concerned about when we started looking at the stuff earlier this year is what's the hypercall overhead like? Like, Can we make hypercalls often uh, and uh, get away with it? So we did some tests and we see that uh, on, on today's hardware, uh, hypercall, hypercalls are very, very fast unless you have nested virtualization turned on. And the latencies that we're fighting are like tens or some, you know, sometimes hundreds of milliseconds. And so a 10 microsecond or 20 microsecond overhead for hypercall is, is not a big deal. And like I said, we don't do the boosting uh, as soon as we know that we're, you know, as soon as we start something important, we, uh, our POC does the boosting only when needed. So what we did is we hacked the VM exit path to detect that, so when, so first of all, the guest sets its intent in uh, in the the structure that is allocated, saying that I'm you know running something important now, or I say you know what the preemption state is. So if preemption is disabled, that's also stored in that structure, and that's all in memory. Uh, there's no uh, boosting that has happened yet, and on the VM exit path, uh, we check that state and we realize oh this is a uh, 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 this is a, uh, we just VM exited from, uh, while the VM was running something important. Uh, so we, we then do the boost at that time. So that avoids, uh, avoids us, uh, do, you know, doing, uh, doing boosting all the time. And we do the boosting only when needed. Did I get that right? Right. So, so that's the uh, asynchronous thing. So we have to do proactive boosting as well in certain cases. So let me go over the two cases. Uh, one is when uh, we, inter uh, we inject interrupts into a guest. So say a vCPU is not running and uh, the, host took, uh, the, the host took a guest interrupt. It now, ha it now has to boost the, the vCPU before it can start running the, the interrupt. Uh, because the interrupt is important. So we, we, we boost the, the, the VCP in advance. Uh, so that's proactive in the sense like the, the host proactively 
you know, knows that the VM is about to run something important and it, it does the boosting. Another case where we do this kind of proactive boosting is when the, when the guest vCPU halts. So when it halts, we know that when the vCPU resumes, it's resuming because uh, it's running like an interrupt handler uh, or something like that, or an IPI handler. And so we know that that is important. So um, this is a very clever idea Vineet came up with where let's just uh, boost it when, when we go idle and we halt. Because we know that it's not running anyway when it's idle, let it stay boosted. And then we don't have to unboost it when we wake it up. Uh, did I miss anything? Okay, so let now let me go over uh, the, the interrupt handling part. Like I said, uh, we have to proactively do boosting uh, when uh, the host injects interrupt into into a guest. The two cases that this can happen is one is if it's an emulated device interrupt, where uh, the VMM has to uh, has to handle the interrupt and then uh, inject it into a VC. Another case is uh, with VFIO pass through devices, um, where if the, if, the, if the vCPU is sleeping and you received a uh, VFIO pass through interrupt, you have to now handle that in the host and, and then, um, well, you have to wake up the vCPU and have that handle it, right? So uh, let, so let me go over this. Uh, can I, sorry, can I ask a question quickly at the yeah, back? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so yeah, you're doing this by boosting the priority of the vCPUs. I'm wondering if you could achieve a similar thing maybe more simply by instead having more vCPUs, uh, basically having a set of vCPUs which are your low priority vCPUs and a set of vCPUs which are high priority. And you basically have a contract with the guest that says if you've got real-time work, you schedule it on the high priority CPUs and we'll always prioritize those. And if you've got background work, put it on the other ones. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we tried that and it, it doesn't work. And it requires the guests to be configured. Like with this stuff, we, we're calling this feature parabot scheduling. Like just drop the, the same kernel into the guest and it just works. It doesn't need to know that these CPUs are RT or these, like, you know, it's, it's fully like, uh, it just works. Um, the other Sur surely the you, guest you, needs to know, like, this is a high priority application. Like, it needs to be able to re reason about its applications yeah, and its interrupts. You have, you have interrupts and stuff. What you have to then do is you have to take the interrupts, assign them to CPUs mm -hmm. that are important. So there's some configuration to do that. The other problem with that is you can have a RT vCPU preempt a, a CFS vCPU, and CFS vCPU might be in the middle of a lock. And so now, now, now you kind of stepped on your own foot because so in our design, what we do is we don't, if that CFS vCPU was uh, was holding a lock, it would already be boosted. So we would never run into this mm. situation where they can step on each other. And so we, we've been trying this for a number of years, and we've tried that already. And uh, this okay. is the first time we're we're at a point where it, it works. So. Since you're interrupting, I thought I'll continue the trend. Um, so just from experience of trying to use hypercalls for our other needs for VMCP freak and whatnot, the impression was the KVM community hated it. Like, get away from hypercalls. Community hated it? KVM community. Mm -hmm. And in our case, it was easy. This is use MMIO. Yeah, right? I, Emulated I, I, device, it works. But could you use kind of some kind of like shared memory to indicate this externally? Yeah, we do use shared memory already. The thing is, during the unboost, we have to make that synchronous. So, uh, but during boost, we we do make it only shared memory. Uh, yeah. So boosting is a, like a fast boosting is a fast path where you update the shared memory and let the vCPU run as long as it can run. So you update the shared memory on the VM side and the host side you read it. Host side will not read it until the next. Correct. Period. Correct. Yeah, Whenever yeah. it needs it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe, I don't know, send a useless interrupt or trigger a switch to host instead of hypercalls, maybe, where you make it look like a device. Anyway, you can, I'm sure, anyway, you'll know it when you send it out, but that's the first. Yeah, it's not pretty, but it, it works really well. And uh, we presented this uh, before, uh, and there were KVM folks in the crowd, and, uh, you know, nobody threw any tomatoes or anything. That's good to know. <laughs> at us. Cool. Uh, 
nobody was jumping in joy, but uh, but you know. Uh, do you think there would be any security concerns for this? So, for, if you have a malicious VM, it could just keep yeah. on asking for boost, and then the other VMs will get blocked. Yeah, to some degree, the VMs have to be trusted, but we do have protections where VM cannot just request a boost and not uh, unboost. Uh, we uh, implemented, uh, uh, you know, fail guardrails for that kind of stuff. We have timers that take away the boost if you don't, uh, unbo you know, unboost okay. soon enough. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely uh, some concerns are in that area, but uh, yeah, but we have to do something about this problem. So uh, you know, maybe people who want, have trusted you know, run their own kernels and guests, they could benefit from this. So they turn it on and, you know, the others like the cloud guys don't turn it on. That might be an option. That's why we made it fully configurable and tunable and all that. So now, uh, oh, okay. So let me go over interrupt handling. So this timeline, we have uh, we have an interrupt that's injected into the uh, in a vCPU. And what we realized is that we have to boost the vCPU thread as early as possible. We can't, we can't make the vCPU thread boost itself in the VM interpath because it's a chicken and egg problem. Like the vCPU, when it's doing the VM enter, it's not running at high priority. So we have to boost it before we actually run the vCPU thread. So the VMM uh, boosts the vCPU thread and wakes up the wakes up vCPU thread and vCPU thread enter, enters the guest mode and starts running the interrupt. Um, once we're in the guest, uh, you know, we do the interrupt, we're already boosted at that point. And then we, uh, in the interrupt exit path, we check the need rescat flag, which tells us if there's something else that uh, needs to run. And if that flag is not set, or we're exiting to CFS, then we synchronously uh, do an unboost. And then we return, um, you know, once we get, once we deboost, we go back to the VM. And uh, posted interrupt handling is similar. Posted interrupts are basically the guest directly uh, services the interrupt without the host ever knowing. So as I mentioned, uh, we have to do something inside the guest on the interrupt entry path uh, uh, to, to make this work. So what we do is we set the shared memory uh, with the, uh, with the, with the request, but we don't do a hyper call like I mentioned. But if while we were in the post interrupt handler, if we did a, if we had a VM exit, then again in the VM exit we would boost. Uh, I should mention that um, if the VCP was already boosted when the interrupt uh, came, then we just directly go and execute the interrupt. But if it's if it's not boosted, then we just we set that we set the status that. This is like we need we need to run as booster if you ever VM exit in the future. And then the you know once the interrupt handler finishes running, uh, then it has to do a deboost. If it's exit if the interrupt is if there are no soft IRQ spending because after the interrupt exits you might run soft IRQ, and those soft IRQs also have to run at high priority. So the interrupt exit path we checked as no soft IRQ spending. Uh, preemption is uh, en enabled when we when we're, uh, uh, when we're exiting, and there's no RT task that we, we we interrupted. So if all those conditions are true, then we know that it, okay, it's time to deboost now. Otherwise, we depend on the scheduler. You know, if let's say an RT task was interrupted by a posted interrupt, then we don't deboost on the interrupt exit. We let the scheduler. Uh, when it switches from RT to CFS, at that point we do the do the deboost. So here's some uh, some info about the, the shared memory implementation. So basically, we have three fields in the structure that the guest allocates. We have the boost request. Uh, we have the PM disabled uh, field, and then we have whether the vCPU thread is actually boosted or not. So for example, if the VCP was already boosted, uh, then we don't request, uh, we don't need to do anything, uh, you know, in the, uh, 
in, the, in different paths. Like for example, if it was never boosted, then we don't need to do the unboost hyper call. So it basically keeps track of whether the host has boosted us or not. Yeah, so, uh, so the uh, boost status is set by the host and read by the guest, but the guest get info is set by the guest and read by the host. So that's why we have kept it separate. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, good point. Okay, so I'll hand it back to Vinny to, to, show, to tell us why this stuff really, really matters and we can totally help screen that. <laughs> cool. Um, so we have taken some performance numbers. Um, we have some synthetic test and uh, we try to simulate some real workload, real world workload. For the synthetic test, we use cyclic test. Um, running as an RT task, both on the guest and the host. On the guest, we wanted to see if this feature uh, improves the state. And on the host, we wanted to see if it doesn't regresses the current state. And we tested it on idle host and a busy host. Busy is being um, simulated by stress and G. And for cycle test, we used 100 microseconds and 1000 microseconds. Just, just randomly try to test uh, how it looks like. And this was done on a very low end device in uh, Intel N 4020 with two uh, cores and uh, no hyper threads. And on simulating real world workloads, uh, we used an app called Obo Tester uh, to see if, uh, how the audio glitches looks like uh, with and without this fix. So um, this is a lot to grasp in, but I'll, I'll try to explain. So uh, we have uh, cycle test running as uh, RT sked RR, and on the on, uh, so there are on, on the left side you have uh, the VM data, on the right side you have the host data. On the first row you have the average latency reported by cycle test. On the second row we have the max latency reported by the cycle test. And we have three cases: one is the vanilla kernel, one is VCP boost is our feature, and static RT is uh, the ideal case where you have vCPUs running always as RT. So you use task set, sorry, CHRT to set the vCPU threads to RT. So on a, this is on an ideal host. And as you can see, the average latency inside the VM for vanilla vCP boost and static RT is comparable. And on the host also it's comparable. But on the max latency, it's not as good as RT because you don't, you don't always boost to RT. Uh, but it's much better than vanilla. Um, uh, and on the, so this is an idle system, remember. So it should be as good as RT. What we suspect is migrations because uh, RT does uh, very aggressive migration and it, it might be the latency cost due to migration, but we are yet to do more investigation on that. But if you see the host side of things, um, static RT is really de detrimental to the system. So VCP boost and vanilla performs more or less the same, but putting static RT, uh, the VCPU takes over and the host, it, it hurts the host. Now let's move to the busy uh, host. So stress NG is running on the host, cyclic test is running on the host and the guest. So uh, the vanilla, again, the, on the average case, VCPU boost is as good as static RT on an average case. And on the host also, it's more or less the same. But when we come to the 99% the maximum latency, it's uh, on the VM side, it's in between vanilla and static RT. It's performing much better than vanilla, but not as good as RT because it's not always boosted. And if you see the host side of the things, the static RT is hurting performance. Uh, so VCP boost does a much better job for not hurting the host. Um, next is we try to simulate a real world workload using the Obo tester app. What it does is try to count the audio glitches that happens uh, while playing back audio. So we tested with multiple buffer sizes. So there is a two millisecond, five millisecond and 10 millisecond. So what happens is there are multiple entities in the audio stack, starting from the serve, uh, app all the way to the device. So two millisecond means every entity gets woken up every two milliseconds and it writes 96 uh, frames to, to the next one in the stack. So here a wake up happens for all the entities. And as you can see on a, on a no loaded system, like it's an idle system, um, VCP boost performs better than uh, vanilla. 
similarly for a busy system which is simulated by speedometer it's it's uh, performing much better so this is like a simulating a real world workload and again i apologize for a very uh, shady like uh, vague image but this is the same video like example that i showed initially with the fix applied uh, so you have this is the vcpu that's running and as it comes here there is the surface flinger uh, i'm sure you will not be able to read it but what runs is a surface flinger and it's a rt priority so um, it gets to run uh, uh, it gets to uh, preempt what is running on the host and it it gets to run through its completion so and uh, while playing the video uh, there, there was minimal lag it was a loaded system and there was minimal lag so real world also seems to improve things uh, with this patch okay now let's come back to the generic case so this was a very specific case of boosting the priority to reduce latency but this this idea of cooperative scheduling can be extended uh, we have we have a lot of use cases that could benefit from this idea of cooperative uh, scheduling where the host can share information with the guest and the guest can share information with the host so a couple of things that we have ident identified um, one is the host can share the physical cpu load pressure placement etc and then based on this data the vc the guest can basically uh, decide where to run what similarly the guest can share its information with the host and the host can decide where to place the vcpus based on that one of the uh, one of the things i was thinking about for the the first point was uh, with, uh, vincent has been looking into uh, how to uh, take into account uh, pressure from from different sources in the scheduler so i uh, i was thinking like if the guest if we could reuse that mechanism in the guest scheduler if we if we were having host if the host cpu that the guest was the vcpu was running on had like a lot of uh, you know it was crowded and had a lot of a uh, lot of tasks on, on it if we had that information in the in the guest we could do better placement decision and we really have that problem we're getting traces where people are like that's a horrible vcpu to run anything on in this situation like why did why did you select that so because we don't know what's happening on the host so just the tiny yeah Ten? No, we don't do pinning. We don't have so, enough. So what does it mean, VCPU physical placement? Because a VCPU can just move off to some other physical place if it's not. It could awareness. move out. But... So the host can make a educated decision about where to move it. That's what we mean by VCPU placement. So if the guest say, says that this is my current workload, the host can make a educated decision about that. That's what. Yeah. So this is just like we're thinking like in the future, what can we do? We have not done that, but in theory, since we in CFS we take into account pressure from different things, like if RT is running or IRQs, you know. So why not also have a pressure signal for whether something what's going on on the host uh, host VCPU? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, for the letting the host know about the workload inside the VCPU. Wouldn't our talk about the VMCP freak gonna take care of it because we update Util? Kind, yeah, or kind some, of. You try and update Util there at least. Yeah. Up. I think that we should, should take uh, care of that. We should coordinate on some kind of interface sure. where maybe and we can. Uh, for the other direction, I was thinking, and David's been thinking about it too, is to emulate the host load as a thermal pressure. Right, it's not thermal, but we don't need to. Yeah, that that's right? fine with me. But Emulate the thermal pressure or whatever, some kind of pressure. Right pressure. <laughs> it sounds to me like you're, you're somehow making the scheduler more and more. Uh, it almost sounds like you're making it transparent between the between the guests yeah. and and the. Host that's kind the of, problem, and to right? To me, like the only fair enough. I don't know much about VM, so whatever. But uh, it would make a lot more sense if you had like a pluggable scheduler where you had like. You know, in, that, my, my thing is with with the CFS scheduler, it's kind of a that very sounds good. On, uh, like that that sounds good to say, and we are talked about that as well. It's very hard to do because you have a you have a VM boundary, so you have two schedulers, uh, and it you know it just 
We have looked into that and it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but uh, we, we could talk about it. Uh, no, the, the, the only objection that I, I don't have an objection because I don't maintain anything in this area is that in the, the, this is a very generic sort of scheduler and it seems like a very special use case. Uh, how, how likely do you think this is going to be upstreamable? I, I think our job is to show the data so that we, we need this for our products and uh, do our best to upstream it, right? Um, and, yeah. And we can do it, like, we'll not be integrating it to the main, like, what the idea is to use as a, a paravit ops. So it will be only used when a VM is in action. Yep. Like, the, uh, when the VM doesn't send any information to the host, the host, it's a no up on the host. Yeah, so. Sure. Yeah, so uh, so that way it will be still a very generic scheduler, but it might tra it transform itself into a different scheduler when it needs to. That that's that's the idea that I envision. Yeah, and I, I just want to mention another use case is actually RCU. Uh, Paul just uh, walked in at the right time. Um, so basically, this is a real problem we are seeing where in Android where not able to, we're, we're having RCU problems uh, because we're not able to leverage RCU priority boosting and um, the RCU K threads that are set to RT, like for expedited RCU. Uh, like those, like when, when the VM uh, does all those uh, things, it, the host has no idea that. And so we have RCU stalls and stuff that are happening uh, inside the guest. And I'm looking at bug reports right now. So, uh, so this stuff, I, I strongly believe that we could uh, make use of it. Yeah, Paul? Just coming back on this thermal pressure, you, you have to take care about, we're speaking probably about two different things. The thermal pressure, it's about a performance capping, and what you have in mind is about cycle used by someone else outside your VM. And you, in different talk, I have seen the confusion between stealing some cycle or asking for cycle to run and at which performance level, which are two different metrics. The other point is that normally in the VM, in, in, the, in, the, in the CPU capacity, we are tracking the stolen cycle in the VM. So I don't know how you, this can be used and how this can be reflected to you about how much cycle, um, how much capacity is really available, but normally, just like IRQ can steal some cycle to the CFS, we are tracking the stolen time by other VM in the VM. So you should get you should get this feedback somewhere. But it's so you're saying it's there right now. We are tracking normally the capacity. We can report how much capacity is available for CFS after removing the RT thread, the IRQ, and the stolen time if you're in a VM. Yes. Okay. So you're talking about the steel time uh, yeah. stuff. I f yeah. As far as I know, that's not implemented in all architectures. But yeah. That, but it's there. Okay. So we should look into that. Yeah. Maybe. But yeah, we were thinking that that mechanism also could uh, use this stuff, right? Yeah. Like on the. Another thing we have is the preempt. Uh, if the vCPU is preempted. Yeah. Go ahead. Paul. So uh, there was a earlier effort that was much more special case than this but it was an academic effort uh, to uh, and involve the RCU CPU stall warnings where a vCPU preemption would happen in the middle of an RC reads that critical section and the thing would stall. Yep. And they did something similar where, the, where they had the RCU grace period mechanism hint to the hypervisor. I think you have a more general solution where you're relying on the fact that the priority boosting comes in and does it for you. Mm -hmm. But there's at least a, uh, another uh, proof of concept of that part of what you're doing in the past. Uh, if I don't yeah. send, there's Usenix papers published on the problem statement. If I don't send that to you, bug me. Yeah. Okay. Do you know off the top, like what they were doing? Like, kind of. Uh, it, it was it was specific to the uh, power hypervisor, and so they had a uh, situation where they just made the. Grace period K thread when it would have otherwise done the priority boosting, or in addition to the priority boosting, would go and they made a new hypercall, and the hypercall said essentially, you know, get this guy going. Okay. Uh, this this vCPU needs more time. 
Okay. And I don't know the details of what was in there, and if I did, I probably wouldn't be allowed to talk about them. But yeah, no that was more or less what happened. Yeah. We we really started doing that, and we switched to the BMX. To oh, the, the the thing is that the priority boosting makes up that funny RT mutex, and mm -hmm. then acquires it, and it's got higher priority, and then pretends that the other guy already holds it. Yeah, yeah. And so, but on the host that, end, that means what you're doing just works automatically. Yeah, the exactly. That's why that's I'm so excited that. about this stuff because that, we that's, get that's all why the, so we have proof, yeah. proof of concept in the past. Now, the reason that didn't go anywhere was that on the IBM hardware it was theoretical. We didn't see that problem happening. So okay. as I said, it was an academic effort. Okay. So, so from what I understand here is that you're using MSI to let the host get communication. And all the test is based on a good assumption here. But from a security perspective, like uh, yeah. yeah you so if there's an attacker or some some guy that's, has that's, keep fake some of the workload there, so it will keep the no. the host to to do like a, you, you know that. Yeah. So, so so that that's definitely a concern. So uh, in one of the uh, first slides we had that so the host should have throttling and forceful unboosting mechanisms if it sees patterns that look like a rogue kernel or a buggy kernel. Yeah. So um, we have implemented it partially, but that should be there in place. Otherwise, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but also like I, I just wanted to mention that uh, in our like it depends on your system, like how much control you have over the guest. Like in our case, we provide the guest kernels and everything, so we would turn this on. But if we were running random VMs that we had no control over and that was using this feature, then we'd probably turn it off. Okay. So we can get away with it because because we control the stack much more. Um, that, that's how I look at it. Um, yeah, I'm thinking like public cloud, probably yeah. no. Yeah, you probably Private don't want to do this yeah. uh, unless there's yeah. a better security model. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, do you want to speak, Joey? Okay. I think you're probably going to say similar things. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, have you tried boosting with uh, nice value or latency nice? Um, Not yet. Not yet, but we on on a different scenario. Like we were expecting, Joel was expecting this question. So on a different scenario, we found out that boosting to CFS might not always give you the uh, result that you want. For example, uh, CFS is not strictly priority aware. For for example, um, if a vCPU is uh, boosted using nice value, it gets a more V runtime. But once it's exhaust its runtime. And then an interrupt comes. There is no way that you could get it to run. So only a strictly priority-based scheduling will get you there. So um, it would work, and it, it would work for your use case. Based on your use case, you can either use it as a ZFS boosting or a RT boosting. And we are planning to make it a tunable. Yeah. Whether you can turn it on and off, uh, which VMs you want it on, what priorities to boost, what to unboost, we'll make all of that tunable. And uh, that's how it should be, like a system design usage than uh, anything. But Just coming back to the kind of security model in the public cloud aspect, I think that this definitely is interesting for cloud providers as well, because you know customer VMs at some point care about latency and at other yeah. points don't care about latency. And if we can improve that, that's great for our customers. So I think that whatever you, whatever you end up doing here should have a clear path to making it Secure, you know, where where you've yep. got you've got a good idea about throttling and protection mechanisms and all yep. that sort of thing, so that it can be used on a public cloud to give customers uh, good latency, low okay. latency. Sounds good. Um, one other thing was maybe if you did the setting and uh, boosting and unboosting, you're probably using scared set attribute to set it. If, as long as you're calling it from the context of the thread you're affecting, then existing mechanisms of preventing threads from boosting themselves to RT would apply. But I think some of the cases you're talking about, you don't necessarily call the set attribute in the context of the thread itself. We call it in the context of the thread because it's VM in the VM exit and the hypercall is. No, also... no, in the VM enter, you said they had a chicken and egg issue, right? Yeah, so that's. You might true. not be calling it from the context we... of the thread. As long as you call it from the context of the thread all the times, yeah. all the security issues are taken care of. Like, how is it taken care of? Because. Because, like, you can set, like, hey, you, you, like, the sysadmin can set whether the. An app can boost itself to RT, right? Like not any app can set itself to RT, for example. There's a limit on what nice values you can change yourself to. 
in a default system. Nothing to do with VM, like even in a normal context. Okay. Like for an Android, like any random app concept is also RT because it's so limited. Yeah, in this specific case, we don't go to user land to do the setting, so. No, you don't need to, that's what, yeah, I didn't say go to user land, right? Set it in the context of the thread, it's fine. Okay, okay, yeah, understood, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.